Okay, so it did not have that box come up and that's probably because I just added it after I already set the no, meeting. It came up. It came, it came up. up. It came up. Oh, it did. I did. It didn't come up on my screen, I guess, because well, I'm the host. Because you're the host, so oh. you already <laughs> consented. Yeah, it came up for us. Don't worry. Okay. So I'll give you just a second to click that box that you consent um, to uh, possibly during question answer um, being recorded. And uh, because up until then, it'll just be Margaret. So, um, and, and as Margaret said, if you want to ask something, but you don't want your face on there, you can turn your camera off and still have your audio on, or you can chat in the chat box. So you don't even have to talk or have your picture up there. Um, if you prefer that. All right, so I'm just going to let it. Did I forget anything, Elaine? No, I think okay. Good. Yeah. Good. Margaret, can you think of anything I forgot at this point? No, I can't. Okay, great. Good. That I am going to let you take it away. Thank you very much. I, it's, I, I do want to say what an honor it is to have Margaret Randall as our featured creative for Creatives in Conversation. I can't think of someone who's more creative at this point. So it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Margaret. Well, thank you, Mary, for the opportunity of this beautiful virtual event. And thanks to everyone who's accompanying us these are such difficult times and we count on poetry and the visual arts and music and other creative endeavors to write our real history and keep our spirits up. And so I'm speaking to you from my studio in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Although you'll see a backdrop made from a photograph that I took a few years ago at Bryce Canyon in Utah been experimenting with that kind of thing. So I want to start by reading some excerpts from I Never Left Home, uh, my memoir, which was released uh, by Duke University Press in March. And since mine is a memoir that focuses on place, it seemed fitting to read against this background. Then I'll switch to my studio later when I read some poetry. So this then um, is from the uh, chapter two of the, of the memoir, early in the book. I was born at Manhattan's Lenox Hill Hospital on December 6th, 1936. The name on my birth certificate was Margaret Jo Reinthal, later changed to Randall. The Jo was for my maternal grandmother, Josephine, a woman I disliked and feared. The attending physician was mother's uncle, Harry Davidson, my grandfather's brother, whom I, I've been told was the hospital's head of obstetrics. Less than a year before, mother had given birth to a daughter who died a few, a few hours later. She always said it was as if she had been pregnant with me for 18 months. Stories about this older sister changed over time. For years, mother said she too had been named Margaret, something about which I remember feeling uneasy, as if I would usurped another's name or identity. Later, she changed her story. No, of course not, she said. How did you get that idea? You come up with the craziest things. Your sister didn't live long enough to have a name. That sort of shift was a constant in my family of origin. Some piece of information upon which I had come to depend would take a, a sudden turn or vaporize on mother's lips. In 1936, the year of my birth, the lynching of black men in the Southern United States and even in the North was a common occurrence. And it was only the most visible atrocity in a pattern of entrenched Jim Crow affecting every black person and whether or not they were conscious of it, the humanity of every white. A few whites were beginning to understand that they had to take a stand. That same year, the Association of Southern Women for the Prevention of Lynching had been endorsed by 35,000 Southern white women. The 1930s saw an upsurge in people's struggles, including interracial political organizations for equality uh, against anti-miscegenation mis laws. I always have a problem with that word and officialized violence. The US Communist Party was legal and active. 
the Wobblies road freight trains, spreading the doctrine of one big union and selling poetry pamphlets for a penny. When I was young, I remember my father's pride in donating money to Negro causes, as they were called back then. He contributed to the NAACP and United Negro College Fund, and he frequently spoke to us about racial prejudice and how wrong it was. This was a moral question for my father, shared by my mother, at least theoretically but neither was able to internalize the struggle against racism or work for anti-racist causes. They had no friends who were non-white. Anti-Semitism still kept Jews out of many US colleges and country clubs. This hit closer to home for us. My parents' response was to distance themselves from their Jewishness rather than identify with the oppressed. As I grew up, I acquired some consciousness about the issue and began to question them about the name change. They always began their response by pointing out the difference between race and religion. Judaism was a religion, they said, and since they didn't subscribe to it, they weren't Jews. I remember asking if Davidson, my maternal grandparent's surname, wasn't Jewish, son of David. My mother told me it was Scotch. Your ancestors even have their own plaid, she said, as if to reinforce her argument. I'd asked if there were no Jews in Scotland, and she would fall silent. Others, Native Americans, Hispanics, or Chicanos, Italians, Eastern Europeans, even the ethnically Irish, were absent from my childhood because, quote, we just don't know any, unquote. Our neighbors were segregated, which meant our schools were as well. Race, economic status, and culture kept us apart. My parents' contact with people different from themselves was limited to those whom they thought might, whom they might come in, with whom they might come in contact in service jobs, and to the compartmentalization that often well-intentioned tolerance exudes. Much later, when we moved to New Mexico, Mother asked a Mexican-American waitress whose face she thought exotic to pose for a clay bust. As for gender or sexual politics, we were years away from articulating them. My mother didn't participate in the cheerful housewifely activities of her time, but her rejection of them was compelled by her always frustrated quest for satisfaction translated into a self-centeredness and need for approval from others rather than any sort of gender consciousness. My father wasn't a dominant or domineering man. His innate kindness and generosity of spirit dictated he do more than his share of work around the house. I remember him washing dishes, running the washing machine and vacuuming when no one else's father engaged in those tasks long before it was fashionable to speak of male, female roles. He was a model in this respect, but they had never really questioned the traditional family structure. He had a salaried job, mother stayed home. So that's from chapter two and subsequent chapters cover my growing up in New York and New Mexico, my return to New York in the 1950s when I lived among the abstract expressionist painters and beat poets. My life as a single mother and my decision to take my son to Mexico. Here are a few brief excerpts from chapter five, which covers my years in Mexico through the turbulent 1960s. My 10 month old son Gregory and I made a brief exploratory trip to Mexico City sometime in the summer of 1961. My friend Rhoda joined us and we stayed at the apartment of Catalan refugee poet Agustí Bartra and his wife Ana. I'd met Agustí and Ana in New York, perhaps through my work at Spanish Refugee Aid. We'd become friends and although they wouldn't be in Mexico at the time, they generously offered us their home. I think their son Roger and daughter Ana welcomed us. That must have been when beat poet and prison escapee Ray Bremser arrived in Mexico City, and along with his wife, Bonnie, also camped for a while at the Bartra's place. Allen Ginsberg had asked if I could help them in Mexico. 
Ray and Bonnie had a little girl not much older than Gregory. Bonnie was turning tricks to support their small family. The child was wantonly neglected. And when Ray and Bonnie themselves decided they wanted to sell, yes, sell her to people better able to parent, it was Elaine, as, as always, who came to their aid. I'm speaking of Elaine de Kooning. She placed the vacant-eyed little girl with a childless couple, collectors of her art, somewhere in Texas. It was a wild scene at the Bartras that summer. Years later, Bonnie wrote a memoir, For Love of Ray, in which she described me as a naive and bourgeois woman too uptight to approve of prostitution or of raising a small child amid clouds of marijuana smoke. I certainly was naive in many ways and clearly bourgeois compared with Ray and Bonnie, but I'd supported Ray's evasion of prison time, played a part in putting them in contact with people south of the border, and don't remember making a judgment about Bonnie's decision to prostitute herself if it was the only way they could survive. I did wonder if it might not be coercion on Ray's part rather than Bonnie's choice. What I found most deeply troubling, troubling was their treatment of their daughter, and also that they were bringing some pretty and unsavory characters into a home I respected and had made available. For Gregory and me, that summer was a prelude to our later Mexican experience. I was testing the waters, imagining what our lives might be like if I decided on a permanent move. Mexico's colonial churches were filled with treasures and pungent with the scent of copal, a nation of corn. The air smelled of nixtamal and roasted chili sprinkled mazorcas could be eaten at stalls along city streets. Ancient stones seemed to speak, telling stories one could only absorb as one became familiar with the landscape and its people. Two imposing snow-capped volcanoes, Popocatepetl and Ixla Cihuatl, dominated the horizon to the south of the city. Another world, but one with which I immediately identified. I was attracted by what I saw of the strong indigenous presence, multiple cultures and generosity of spirit. The other thing I took in was Mexico's natural beauty its great diversity of countryside and multicolored houses lining cobble streets. Purple, red, and white bougainvillea vines, tall as trees, cascaded over volcanic garden walls, and the violet lace of the jacaranda canopy spread its ample branches. The, sp the perspective move felt enticing. Several months later, Gregory and I departed New York on a Greyhound bus headed south. And this is a different excerpt a little further on. Mexico in the 1960s was quiet serenity laced with desperation. Slower than in New York, people worked hard but within a more casual sense of time. Manhattan had always seemed to me a grid, a crisscrossing of straight lines, explosive boxes of energy. In contrast, Mexico City was concentric circles spiraling out from discrete points of consciousness. One walked in and out of temporal dimensions. You never knew when you might find yourself inhabiting another plane. Here the pulse had a different beat, more ancient, less ready-made, magical. My life in Mexico began to take shape and consolidate itself soon after our arrival at the almost nightly salons hosted by Philip Lamantia and his wife, Lucille. Their apartment, centrally located in the Zona Rosa, an upscale neighborhood in Colonia Cuauhtémoc, was spacious and inviting, an ideal venue for a dozen or so young poets to gather, meet, and share new work with one another. I remember those sessions as exhilarating, necessary, Soon I was a regular. The word spread and before I knew it, we were poets from several different latitudes, getting to know one another and eager to have a feel for what each was writing. I should add that the core group was almost entirely male. 
Chilean-born Raquel Hodorowsky, then living in Peru, was a presence. As always, I, 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 I occupied my place without questioning the fact that I was only one of a couple of women writers. The more brilliant attendees included Ernesto Cardinal, a Nicaraguan who would eventually rank among the greatest Latin American writers of his generation. This was before he became a Catholic priest, took part in his country's Sandinista revolution, and when it triumphed in 1979, became its first minister of culture. Undoubtedly, the poet I met at Phillips, who most impacted my life, was the Mexican Sergio Mondragon, a powerful cartography linked the world I had come, <coughs> excuse me, the world I had come from to the one in which I'd arrived. <coughs> Sergio and I hit it off immediately. He was a year older than I. I was attracted to his passion for poetry his interest in creating a community of creative people, his dark indigenous looks, and what seemed a solid commitment to family life. Although I tried hard to endure New York's endless series of brief sexual encounters, I longed for a stable relationship. What I failed to recognize was that I was about to trade freedom for control. At Phillips, we not only shared our own work, but from time to time also something by a poet we admired. Most of us had a rudimentary knowledge of the other's language, but not their culture, not enough to grasp nuance, trace influences, or fully understand what we were hearing. We quickly realized the need for some sort of venue or forum, a bilingual magazine perhaps, where good translation could provide the necessary bridge. Everyone agreed on the need for a remedy to the situation. Sergio and I decided to do something about it. El Cuerno Plumado, the Plumed Horn, was born. And that uh, begins the history of, um, of a magazine, that a bilingual quarterly that uh, lasted for eight years and um, only died um, in 1968 with um, the uh, the advent of the Mexican student movement. Uh, so I write about that. And then um, the chapter on Mexico is actually the longest chapter in the book. So much happened during that uh, decade of the 60s. And then the memoir continues through my participation in the 1968 Mexican student movement, my underground escape to Cuba the following year, and the decade that I lived in that country then my years in Nicaragua and my eventual return to the United States where I was ordered deported because of opinions expressed in some of my writings. I hope some of you will be moved to buy the book. More than simply my personal story, it is the history of a time and of places, monumental moments of social change and the intimate details of those involved in trying to make that change. So now I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, see if I can get rid of this uh, background. And uh, I think, uh, I think I will be able to do that pretty easily. There we go. And uh, here we are. So um, I'm, um, I've now invited you into my studio. You can see the wall behind me. And um, I'm going to close by reading three poems from a collection that will appear next year. I'm tentatively calling the book Out of Violence into Poetry. And uh, the first poem is called My Beginnings and Endings. My beginnings and endings cower within, hiding in groves of limping muscle, braving the rapids on rivers of blood or huddled on islands of fat. They are fearful they may be seen, taken at face value, 
or forced to stand guard as mileposts on back roads, not marked on any map. But the real problems come when an end tries to pass itself off as a beginning, confusing the me who observes as if from afar. When I am part of the equation, my memory struggling to reimagine parts worn through years of indecision. That moment I should have said no or cried a full-throated yes as time saw origins wither, almost die, then rise again, conclusion too often riding on their broken wings. The next poem is called uh, we won't take yes for an answer. We tell them no means no and ask what part of that word they don't understand. Every secret place on the far side of casual conversation disappears after the fire sale. I would tell you, read my lips but fear being taken for a president boasting mission accomplished. There is no mission here, just a vulnerability donning its invisibility cloak of shame. We tell them no means no. They smile disarmingly. We won't take yes for an answer and turn them into pillars of salt. And I'd like to end with a poem that reflects what we're going through right now, a major shift in, I hope, mainstream consciousness. The poem is called Eight Minutes, 46 Seconds. And of course, it was written during the last week of May this year when George Floyd, yet another in a long list of unarmed black men, was murdered by police. The time it took George Floyd to die beneath the rage of white policemen, time slowing to silence as his windpipe shattered beneath that savage knee. Emmett lived hours knowing he'd never see mama. Time stopped for Trayvon when he couldn't talk his killer down and for Sandra in the cell that became her tomb. The clock ran out for Eric, who knew his pleadings were useless, and for the thousands our country lynches in this take no prisoners age. Together they fall, hands raised before regulation bullets, law and order weaponry, bitter fruit swinging from the branches of shamed trees. The murderers wear white robes with pointed hoods or the uniform blues of our city's finest. They may be on or off the job in this us and them that turns the racist joke to hate and then to the war our executioner in chief fuels as he sows and reaps America's killing fields. Eight minutes, 46 seconds. The time it takes fear to morph into murder and democracy to choke on this land that once pretended equality for all. So thank you for listening. I hope some of you may be moved to get the book and read it. And now let's open this event to questions and comments. I see there are a few comments in the chat, so I'll, I'll look at those. Okay, and I'll go ahead and unmute everyone in case anyone would also like to uh, ask a question or um, make a comment for Margaret. Margaret, that was amazing. Um, all, all of it and your word choice and your poetry uh, is so, 
well crafted just the like the ch the choke democracy and so forth i mean just really incredible i have a few other things i'd love to say but we're gonna wait and i'll wait until we see what a, what other people have to say so i'll let you take it over well i i would love some questions or comments so if anyone has anything to say let's turn this into a conversation Hi, Margaret. It's Jules. It's always good to see you. <laughs> oh, wonderful to see both um, of you. Yeah. And I, I just always want to say that you're, you are very inspiring, even in these troubled times that are very stressful. But I think you help us put things in perspective from what you've gone through um, personally and with other countries. And so um, I, I, it helps me to keep everything in the, the big picture of things. So I just want to comment on that. It's lovely coming from you, Jules, because you've done, you do so much for our community, our poetry community here in Albuquerque. And it's just wonderful having you as a part of, of that community and John as well. Well, thanks, yeah, and you too. And when, Margaret was one of the first people that I connected with in New Mexico, so. And I can highly recommend your book as well, <laughs> and all your books. Yeah, I highly recommend her memoir as well. As I said, it, it's a page turner, but I'd like to just go ahead and make a comment and then anyone else jump in. Um, so, and should, uh, should I go ahead and, and we can't, should I do gallery view, take Margaret off of being pinned so that everyone can see each other? Mm -hmm. Or just, yeah, take, okay. Okay, so I'm going to spot cancel the spotlight video. So if you do not want to be recorded, then um, just take your um, your camera off. Okay, for anyone who doesn't want that. So this way, we'll you can put it in gallery view now and and see everyone. Um, and so in this amazing book, I went the first place I went before, and then I went back and started at the beginning. Uh, I went straight to the part in New York when. Margaret was living among all the avant-garde artists um, in the 60s um, because I teach art history. <laughs> and so for me, that was just fascinating. Um, to, but uh, Margaret, you actually, it seems as if your entire life, you were in these amazing creative uh, hubs of people and you made some of course you with your journal and you made some of those communities yourself for sure but you just seem to move among all these legendary you know people with you being one of the legendary people too and um it was just one after another and also as you said it, you know it's it's more than your life because also the time period that you were in you were moving from one um serious you know there was a lot of serious things happening as there are now but it was such a a time of crux and you were involved in so many of these whether they were you know gender or racial or or you know nationality or culture or what and i just want the very beginning of chapter three he writes this is the very beginning if you are a woman alive in the united states today you would have to have been a young girl in the 1950s to understand the weight of gender repression in every fiber of your mind and body. So, and I, when I read that, I absolutely loved it because it, it, it's right. And it, it's this, this struggle that those of us who were in that time period, and I think even now, uh, having to be aware of those gender issues and about women. So that's all I want to say. It's fabulous. Um, but if you wanted to comment or anyone else. Well, I will. I'll comment on that. Um, I, I, it was very important to me to talk about the weight of gender oppression in the 50s. You know, women had come back from, uh, men had come back from the war. Uh, women had, you know, been forced back into the home after taking over men's roles in factories and so forth uh, when the men were at war. And um, it was a time of absolute suffocation for women and young girls. I write about in the book how um, I was in high school in 1952, 53, 54, and young women at that time uh, 
were not encouraged to take math and science courses. You know, uh, it just was assumed that we would get married and someone would take care of us. We didn't need that. It wasn't until 1957 when the uh, Soviets launched Sputnik that the United States, uh, not to, you know, to give women opportunity, but to, to uh, deal with the competition with the Soviet Union, uh, began to, to, um, to encourage women to take those kinds of courses. So it was a really rough time. And I uh, was growing up in that time. And so it was important for me to write about that. Um, I see on the chat that there are several questions from uh, uh, Elaine Ritchell, from uh, Jeannie, um, uh, about, um, about my writing practice. So I guess I'll address that for just a minute or two. Um, I think that my writing practice has changed a lot as I've gotten older. Um, you know, when I was involved with the Cuban Revolution or the Mexican student movement, or when I was raising four children, um, you know, or, and working full time, um, there wasn't that, that opportunity to, you know, devote many hours a day to writing. And I would write um, after everyone else was in bed and sometimes into the early hours of the morning. And sometimes I look back on the books that I produced during those years and I realize that it's not that I'm ashamed of them, um, but I think they could be a lot deeper, uh, a lot more important. They could have been a lot more important if I'd had, if I'd been able to devote myself to my writing, you know, as my primary activity. Uh, now that I'm 83, I'm, I've been retired for many years um, and um, you know, I just feel the luxury of being able to write all the time and I get up early and uh, I write as many hours a day as I can. Um, so that's really my process at the moment. Um, I do a lot of revising, I do a lot of studying, a lot of research. So when I say I write all day, it's not necessarily that I'm actually, you know, hitting the keyboard uh, every day, but um, I'm devoted to my work in, in some way. And I think that, um, one has to uh, be devoted to one's work to do one's best work. Um, I see a question from Marietta Lees to everyone. Uh, having moved to New Mexico in the 1980s, I remember the angst about your moving and trying to stay in the US. Um, is this chapter of your life written about? Yes, it is written about in great detail, the years of my immigration case. So, um, you know, um, I I just gave a taste really in my reading, especially since it was limited to a half hour and I didn't want to exceed that. But I do write about it at length about my childhood. I start the book uh, in my grandparents' generation, uh, come up through my parents, through my childhood, uh, my move to New Mexico with my family, then my move back to New York, um, and then of course Mexico, Cuba, Nicaragua, and then my return to the United States in 1984 and the five years of my immigration case. Um, so, you know, all of that is in there uh, and more. Uh, I mean, it is basically uh, the book um, ends in the press maybe a year and a half ago when I turned the manuscript in. Thank you, Margaret. And I, I see a question from um, Billy Brown about, um, uh, you said something about exchanging something for control in Mexico. Um, can you say more about that? Well, it was in, in, in reference to my marriage. Um, I, uh, Sergio is a wonderful person and we really had this extraordinary experience of, um, of making this magazine for eight years. He's the father of two of my children. But I think that, you know, it was part of my journey um, learning that if you, um, that in, in a conventional marriage very often, the woman um, gives up, control, gives up uh, freedom for control. I think that's the way I put it. And, um, you know, so that's not all I say about Sergio. I say uh, many things about his contribution and we're good friends today. So uh, that's, that's good. But, um, yeah, I do feel that in this patriarchal society, and certainly it's been my experience, um, it's very difficult for 
um, men and women to live together, um, and even women and women to live together. I mean, patriarchy actually um, affects all of us, uh, not just men. Uh, it affects us in different ways. So I do write about that throughout the book. There was a question here too from Paula Levine. You said, uh, how has your relationship to the past changed through your recollection and finding words to write about it? That's a great question, Paula. Um, yeah, you know, I, I write in the introduction to the book about sort of how I uh, approach this. I, um, uh, Barbara and I were uh, with some friends one evening here in Albuquerque, and uh, one of our friends mentioned that um, he didn't think I'd ever written about my years uh, among the abstract expressionists in New York. And so, um, you know, why didn't I do that? And so I, I actually took that to heart and um, I hadn't written about those years, which were really important to me. And so I, um, I started to write about them. I thought I was writing an essay maybe. Um, Barbara, as usual, always knows what I'm doing before I know it. And she knew that I was doing, that I was beginning a memoir. I didn't know that at that point. So I wrote that chapter first, which is the New York chapter. And then um, I went back and I began to realize that she was right, that I was writing a memoir. So I went back to my earliest memories and something very fortuitous happened at that point. Um, I have a very close friend in Spoleto, Italy, who um, I often correspond with. And he, um, you know, so I, I told him in an email that I was writing my memoir. And he said, well, um, about 20 years ago, you sent me a memoir that you had written. It has 607 pages. I'm sure you have a copy. And um, I didn't have a copy, but not only did I not have a copy, um, I had no memory, and I still have no memory of having written that book. Um, so he was kind enough to send me a JPEG of every single one of those 607 pages. I read it and I was, of course I recognized it as mine, but I was also very glad it had never seen publication because I didn't like the tone and, um, you know, but, but having those pages did help me uh, situate moments in my history and in the history in which I've been a part, um, which helped me with the writing of this book. Um, at the age of 82 or 83 or 84, um, your memory isn't what, it, at least my memory is not what it used to be. I have a vivid memory of what I think is important in my history and in the history that I've shared with others. But um, I sometimes conflate moments, people, events, so it was, it was great to have those pages. And, um, and then, uh, oh, from Joan McNeil, this is an interesting question <laughs> I see on the chat. Has the publication of this book had any impact on your relationships with your children and your exes? Uh, well, one of my exes actually wrote that he, he loved the book, which was a relief. Uh, Robert Cohen, who's the father of my youngest daughter. Um, but I, I do have a story to tell about my, uh, one of my, my middle daughter, Jimena. Jimena is the only one of my children who doesn't read or speak English. Uh, and she, it's been very difficult for her to read me over the years because she's only been able to read me in translation. Uh, but her husband uh, reads and speaks perfect English. So she got a copy of the book and she, and he read, translated it for her. Um, orally about 20 pages a day. It took them several months. And this brought us so close. I mean, we weren't d distanced before that, but um, it was an extraordinary experience for both of us because I think she realized for the first time um, things about my life that she didn't know and my own struggles and how they've been reflected in, in her life and her struggles. And so that's that's been um, that's that's been great. Thank you, Billy, for ordering a copy of the book. <laughs> I see that on the chat as well. So um, thanks, Billy, and and I do encourage. Um, it's a great book, and you know this is a free event, and we do get to have amazing people here. So I do like to at least say, if you can support their creative work, please do. So yeah. 
There was a question here from Jean. How did you support yourself and your children in all these different countries? I supported myself and my children in dozens of different ways. I mean, I worked in the, in the garment district in New York. Uh, I've worked as a waitress. I've, um, I've worked as a secretary, a typist, a receptionist. Um, in, when I moved to, I've worked as a translator uh, in Mexico. I've written dance reviews and theater reviews in Mexico. Uh, when I moved to Cuba, uh, I began to have the experience that one has in a revolution, in a socialist revolution, where um, there's an attempt at least to uh, have people working in areas that, um, for which they have talents and, and that are interesting to them. So when I went to Cuba, I began working as an editor, as a translator, as a writer, uh, that was where I wrote my first book of, of oral history with women, um, followed by many other books in that genre. And then in Nicaragua as well, because um, it was, you know, the first years of the, of the Sandinista revolution, um, I was able to work in areas that were much more attuned to, to my desires and my talents. Um, in Nicaragua, I had some really interesting jobs. The first um, year I worked at the Ministry of Culture under um, Ernesto Cardinal, my old friend who had been with us at the inception of El Corno. Um, and then uh, the ne for the next three years, I worked um, with, a, with um, a government organization that was trying to, um, trying to figure out how to change media um, to reflect revolutionary values, um, everything from um, from uh, you know the news to uh, soap operas, uh, because the, the the temptation when you make a revolution is you know you're going to have the uh, instead of the the young actress and the the her boyfriend, you know you're going to probably have the young militia woman and, and Oh, sorry, Margaret. Margaret, wait. That's not, um, that's not really where it's at. You know, you have to, uh, it, you can't impose revolutionary values on uh, people who've been doing uh, television and radio and, and print media for years. You have to get them to understand the need for those changes. So that was interesting work where I learned a lot. Um, and um, let's see, um, Billy Brown asks, if you have time, tell us a little bit about your receiving your honorary doctorate from UNM. Um, I would have guessed UNM might be too conservative for that. Well, they were for quite a while. Um, I, the, the people, who, the, the dear people who, uh, wanted me to get that honorary doctorate um, were um, tried to, um, they, they prepared the, um, the, uh, all the materials that were necessary uh, so that I would get it in 2018. And at that point, the university preferred not to give it to anybody so as not to have to give it to me. So nobody got the honorary doctorate in, 19, in 2018. But um, the following year, Susana Martinez left office, as everyone knows, and, uh, and uh, we had a, a new governor, um, and she's great. And, um, and then she um, actually um, placed two new members, uh, two new trustees um, at the university. Um, to uh, replace the trustees who had been, who had objected to my getting the honorary doctorate. And so I did get it last year in, in 2019. And um, it was, um, it was very nice, I must admit. Uh, and uh, I'm especially grateful to Eleni, Eleni Bastea, the wonderful professor who did all the footwork and unfortunately died uh, just a few months after um, I got that, but um, but uh, yeah, that was that was a lovely moment actually. Yeah, congratulations, and the award also from the AWP this year too. 
Um, so. yeah, I guess when you get as old as I, um, you, you begin to get awards. Maybe they want to uh, try to give them to you before you die or something. So I was very grateful for that. And also for one I just got um, about a month ago, which was the uh, Paolo Freire Award from Chapman University. Uh, Paolo Freire was a Brazilian educator who was very important to people in my generation and, and beyond. And so that, that moved me very much. So yeah, it's been, it's been kind of nice to finally, I never used to win anything <laughs> and I never um, got any awards or anything. So now they're sort of coming um, all at once, which, which has been fun. Yeah, well, maybe they're starting to see too that what maybe they thought was oh so radical is actually human. You know, what you've done is so human. And I want to, you've got a lot of questions here. We're going to go ahead and, and spend a little bit more time with the questions because they're so good. Um, but I, I wanted to ask, uh, what was your, how would you describe your motivating, your motivation for, uh, I mean, the things that you did are definitely extraordinary and uh, on so many levels. So well, they weren't that extraordinary, uh, Mary, at the time, you know, I think that um, some of them seem extraordinary in retrospect. But basically, I just uh, followed my heart and my interests and my curiosity uh, when I went to New York, when I went to Mexico, when I went to uh, Cuba and Nicaragua. Um, I, I always really wanted to know the people and the cultures where I was. And so I tried to become as much a part of that, that society as I could, even as an outsider. Um, but you know, many of the people who were important to me in the 60s, 70s, um, now they, many of them are, you know, quite well known and so forth, but they weren't that well known at the time. I mean, in some cases we were all sort of starting out together, uh, but they, you know, became, became very well known later. Um, I don't know why I always seem to be among the youngest. Now I seem to be among the oldest of everyone I know, but at the time, in those years, I seemed to be the, the youngest. And there's a question here from Matt Johnson, which I think is interesting. Uh, he says, um, how would you describe the revolutionary spirit of the 1960s to young people today who are active politically? What similarities and differences do you see between the 60s and today in terms of youth protest movements? I guess I, I would say that uh, I think that the young people today are absolutely extraordinary. And, you know, I, I felt that we were extraordinary in the 60s too. Um, we, we risked a lot. We, a lot of us died. Um, you know, there was a lot of sacrifice. There was a lot of energy. We were irreverent. We were absolutely um, opposed to the hypocrisy of society. But I think one of the things that limited us in the 60s and 70s was that um, political parties had a lot of power. Um, you know, the, the communist parties, the socialist parties. Um, and as we can see in retrospect, while those parties um, made, made a lot of progress in some places, they were also, um, very conventional in many ways and very uh, authoritarian, very top down. Uh, those of us who were not in the leadership um, didn't tend to question our leaders. We just sort of went along with, with whatever. And uh, so a lot of people were left out. You know, as women, we were told, oh, you know, um, we can't concern ourselves with your problems until, you know, we won the revolution and then, then we will race was equally uh, cast aside, um, you know, uh, gay rights, of course, weren't even on the agenda at that point. So I think that one of our problems, as I look back on it, and of course, this is easier to see in retrospect, is that uh, many of those movements were very exclusionary. And um, although young people gave their all, sometimes they gave their all, um, for failure. Uh, so I think today, um, at least what I'm seeing in this country and, and around the world, is that um, young people are asking a lot more questions, they're more independent, uh, they're demanding um, 
equality for everyone, for all groups. So that's, that's really something that's heartening me. Um, and I, I thank you for that question, Matt. Yeah, you've got some great comments here from Billy and uh, Joan and, and everyone. Uh, Billy, with the deepest respect. I, there's a question from someone, Deborah Turner, who uh, wanted to be here and had another engagement. And she said, extend her apologies. Oh, and I also want to apologize because there was feedback. So I actually muted everyone and it, I didn't, it would muted Margaret for just a few seconds there. But I think, so when you see this recording, Margaret, I apologize. Um, she asks, the moment you became a poet is a powerful one as described in your memoir. I wonder about whether there are times in your life when you had to learn to balance risk with the stability we writers sometimes need to craft our works. Your memoir's title juxtaposed with its content suggests tension to this end, um, as does the video of other poems, including Everyone Lied, I assessed from your website. Was there any, um, was there any, I guess, tension or uh, uh, times in your life when you had to learn to balance risk with stability to craft your works? Well, I don't know about balancing risk with stability because I always went for risk, but I do, it, it's, a, it's an important question. And I would say that um, there's always been tension in my life until recently when I'm able as an older person to, to you know, devote myself to my work uh, full time. There's always a tension and it's so much more extreme for women or it has been more extreme for women in my generation, especially. I mean, I know so many women who put their husbands through, uh, or boyfriends through uh, college and graduate degrees, and you know, their, their um, whatever their passion was, was always going to be left for later. And then sometimes they were on their own. And, and then just uh, the society's uh, pressures, you know, the, the woman was always, um, the mother was always the one who, um, who had to care for the home and very often work at the same time outside the home. So I experienced that through most of my life. Um, and as I say, I'm just incredibly grateful now um, that I live with an artist, Barbara, and uh, she is so uh, not just respectful of my work, but encouraging of it as I am of hers. And so, you know, um, I don't feel those tensions anymore, but those tensions are still alive and well in our society. And there's a reason why in college courses, uh, when people study poetry, they you know, will study maybe a hundred men to every woman. If that, um, it's perhaps gotten a bit better in recent years, but not that much. So, um, so yes, those tensions are there and uh, we just can't let our guard down. Uh, if my, my, uh, my feeling has always been, um, I can do it all. <laughs> uh, that doesn't mean that I always could do it all. But from the time I was very young, I just um, sort of, you know, assumed that I could be a mother and I could support myself and my children and I could uh, be a writer and, and so forth. And um, so I just, you know, floundered around and, and learned how to do that. Um, but um, it wasn't easy. and. Uh, you know, I think that's something that uh, all creative people really have to struggle with, not just women, I should say, in fairness to men, that, um, you know, male writers and poets and artists also have um, tensions because, you know, they're supposed to make a living, they're supposed to have, create a stable home, etc. And that often does not come with, um, with uh, creative pursuits. But I think it is a lot harder for women. And I think it's hard in a way for everyone just because art is not respected in this society. I mean, I have lived in societies like Cuba and Nicaragua where art is respected and you go to a poetry reading and there's 5,000 people there. And uh, we just don't have that in this country. And so, you know, because it's not respected, um, I think the tensions are greater. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been wonderful. I do hate to cut it off because it's incredible. Everything that you're saying I, resonates, I think, with so many of us in so many ways and gives us um, 
you know, bolsters what we, you know, want to achieve and do um, and be creative. Uh, Joan says, one of the things in your memoir that sticks in my mind is that Robert was the only one of the three fathers of your children who shared some of the financial responsibility for the family. Given that, it's amazing that you managed to publish as many books as you have. And even, I mean, just the fact that she was moving and trying to get to her family in Cuba and had to go by way of Greenland or Iceland or I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, all the things and then she's and she's working in writing professions and then she writes all these books. It's incredible. Well, part of that is because I'm 83. <laughs> so, you know, I've had a long life to do that in. But I've been very, very fortunate also to have wonderful editors, wonderful publishing houses. Um, you know, and that's another thing I guess I'd like to say is um, we need to support our independent publishers or independent bookstores because that is the uh, literary culture of this country. And if we leave it all to Barnes and Noble, um, you know, we're not gonna have, um, we're not gonna be reading what we wanna be reading. Okay, well, so we have some thank yous here and congratulations. Yes, we're gonna, Barbara, try to make this um, available. Uh, Margaret wanted to have it recorded and make it available. So at now what I'm going to do is I actually, even though I opened it up to see if there were any, um, uh, well, before we do that, I, let's all give uh, Margaret a huge hand. So thank you, Margaret. Thank you all and thank you for the wonderful questions. I appreciate them. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Was there anyone we do um, have a five minute for open mic? Was there anyone who wanted to do the open mic tonight? Oh, Paula says she ordered your book. Uh, Tim, okay. Tim, sure. the open mic. Is there anyone else? Because we are running a little bit short of time. Did we have anyone else who wanted to do the open mic tonight? It can be anything. It doesn't have to be poetry. Joan, you'd like to? Yeah, yeah. look, I, I, I read it all the way through once. And I'm halfway through it again, and it's fascinating. And I've, um, I've bought three copies for friends that haven't arrived yet from Duke University Press. I'm making it my... Uh, go to gift book <laughs> for the next few months. I think it's Margaret. You really teach us how to be, not not just how to be artists, but how to be, and uh, you give us hope. And not just in the U.S. and Latin America, but also here. I, I'm I'm uh, uh, Margaret is very popular and respected in Canada, and. Uh, it, it was sort of a source of a bit of grief for us that, sh that uh, the humidity here didn't allow her to move up, her and Barbara to move up when uh, the deportation nonsense was going on. But anyway, thank you so much. But uh, yeah, no, but I should say just to clarify that it never occurred to me to leave the country when I was being deported, not to Canada, not to anywhere. I mean, I was going to stay and fight and uh, so, oh, I know. <laughs> although I envy you Canadians living in a sane country, I'll say that. Yeah. That's great comments. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to stop the recording now, and then we'll have two open mic people tonight. Then we'll have, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. Um,